unfortunately, in the last 25 years or so that I've been involved, uh, I guess, uh, either politically, uh, part of tax pact, a member of the school board, um, these types of things, I have not seen the political will from our elected officials to actually go out and do something about it. We hear the talk, we hear the bluster, we see people who are kowtowing to their special interests, and it goes on and on. When we formed our organization, it's Conservative Society for Action, we've got about 5,000 members now. And those people joined the Conservative Society for Action because there was no action by the parties, no action by the politicians, no action by the bureaucracy. I'm coming from the standpoint that we have to take decisive action, we have to create the political will. Now, I know you gentlemen up here are pretty much, uh, you know, understand the crisis that's facing us right now. But you're going to have to go back up to Albany and to the Assembly and work with some people that don't necessarily agree with you. However, it looks like we can have some inroads. We have a governor now, believe it or not, who almost sounds like a Tea Party guy. <laughs> Listen, that, that's, you know, that's welcome. Whether he means it or not, I don't know. As I said, the devil is in the detail. One of the reasons I came here today is because Listen, I started going up to Albany 25 years ago. As I said, as a member of the school board, school board's association, I was a voting delegate, I went to the national conventions, did all that kind of stuff. Got nowhere. We've been talking about cap, tax cap for decades. A lot of people think it's a new, they think it's new. You know it's not, because you've heard all the proposals, you've heard it before. But we're in a situation right now that it looks like we can actually make it happen. But there's a couple of reasons that we need to make it happen. And again, it all gets down to political will. We look at school boards, we look at the course of education, we look at the course of our municipalities, and there's some realities. The reality is that in the last 10 years, the inflation rate has gone up about 27%. Municipalities and governments went up about 33 to 50%. School spending went up 75%, three times the rate of inflation. Now, you know, as I said, I've been involved with the education, as, as I said, as a school board member, it's been my pet project and my pet peeve for, for decades now. And if there was any kind of relationship between the money spent and the results coming for our education system, we would have the best education system in the world, and we probably do anyway. But if you were to take the lines and draw a graph of salaries, expenses for education, it's a 45 degree angle up. And if you look at outcomes, it's about a 45 degree angle down over the last 20 years. Now we talked about salaries, we talked about expenses, we talked about education. It's the, great, it's the most important thing in the world, that's why I was involved with it. But I remember the days of Ronald Reagan, he got up there and he said, you know what? The only way we're gonna save education and become the best in the world is if we raise salaries for teachers. And we did that, no problem there. All right, so that, the last thing I want to hear is about, uh, you know, that, that teachers aren't making enough money. All right, it's great. My mother's a teacher. My son-in-law is a teacher. My, my, uh, uh, my soon-to-be daughter-in-law is, uh, is, is a teacher. No problem there. It all gets back to political will. And as I look through all of the proposals and all of the things that have happened over the decades, we look at this property tax cap. There is no political will, and there will be no political will at the individual school district level to reduce spending. And even if they have the will, between mandates from the state, ongoing contractual obligations, the cost of our pension programs, it's very difficult to get those costs under control. So I've come to the conclusion that the only way that we're going to get those costs under control is to limit the amount of revenue that a school district has at its disposal. Now over the years I've done it as I was chairman of our finance committee in our school district and you know how it is, you get two basic areas of, uh, of support. You get revenue from the state and you get property tax revenue. And you do the balancing act. And you never know when you do a budget how much you're getting from the state. All you have is a slight projection. There were many times when we thought we were passing a budget where we get a one and a half percent impact on the property tax. Boom, six and a half. Out of our control because all we can do as members of a school board or any other municipality is control costs. And when I was on a board, we never increased spending more than about one and a half to two percent. Yet the impact on our property taxes was twice or three times that. So again, you don't have the kind of control that you need at the local level. As much as I hate states to come in and dictate and take over the responsibility of local municipalities or, or school districts, if we don't limit the access to revenue 
it's going to continue. And I look at a cap, and a lot of people are saying, ah, 2% cap. You know what? It means you can spend 2% more every year. That's not the case. We are members here have formed an organization trying to get costs under control. We want a small, we have smaller government, more efficient government, stable taxes. The tax cap will do that. The tax cap is going to force districts and municipalities to cut spending. And here's how. Even though you can increase spending by 2% on the property tax side, for districts to maintain their levels of spending right now, they're going to need six, seven, eight, or in this one gentleman's case, double digit tax increases. Now, if you were able to cap that and limit the revenue from the property tax side, you're going to look at municipalities and school districts that are going to be faced with a budget gap. They're going to look there and say, we're a half a million short, we're a million short, we're three million short, depending upon the size of the district. Only at that moment are members of school boards, superintendents, going to get together and say, you know what, we have to do something. And you know what, I'm not going to get into the middle of what they do. If you're going to cut salaries, cut administration, cut programs, that's up to the local communities. I have no intentions of micromanaging that or even making suggestions to that case. But there are plenty of places that we can cut. Administrative costs are absolutely out of control. New York City has 1.3 million students with one school chancellor. We have 160 districts just on Long Island with 160 different superintendents, assistant superintendents. You know, when I went to school, we had one building principal. Now you have a building principal and a grade principal and assistant principals. Our administrative costs are way, way too much. We're going to have to start talking about regionalizing administrative costs. Now, I'm not talking about merging school districts because that'll everyone will go nuts. All right? There's no reason that you can't have administrative costs centralized, either at the town level, regional level, or however you want to come up with it. There's no reason that we have to have you know 35 superintendents in Babylon. I mean, Babylon Village. I mean, the building's half the size of this auditorium here, and we we have a you know an a complete administrative staff. There's almost no work in pupil personnel services of, of, of administering 600 employees as there is 6,000. It's all electronic. We're going to have to start to, 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 to make decisions that are actually going to have an impact. And we looked at the history of, of Frank will discuss it a little later, about the history of, of, of tax caps in other states and other regions and other places. It's never had a negative impact. There's another component to this, and just a couple of statistics. All right, between 90, 1999 and 2006, and again, I talked about this before, rate of inflation, 27%, school taxes up 76%. There's another statistic. 22% of the people between the age of 25 and 35 left Long Island in the last decade. Think of it. Think of the impact. These are our future taxpayers. This is our tax base that we're scaring away. 69% of people aged 18 to 34 have commented recent surveys that they are very likely or somewhat likely to move in the next five years. The numbers are devastating. We're losing 8,000 taxpayers a month in New York State. 8,000. Down in Texas, they're picking up 8,000. They're heading down south. The problem with, the, with, the, with the, a, a diminishing tax base is it leaves the rest of us to pay more. Even if we had zero increases, in our school boards, communities, state, every place, every taxing jurisdiction, flatlined at zero for the next 10 years, our taxes are still going to go up because we have people leaving. We have a diminishing tax base. One of the impacts of a 2% tax cap is that we're going to be announcing to the nation and to people who are living here right now that we're serious about tax relief. Everybody out there knows that the biggest, the biggest uh, you know, gorilla on our back right now is property taxes. Businesses don't want to be here. Individuals don't want to be here. I'm not even sure I'm going to be here, to tell you the truth, all right? We have to get property tax relief. A couple of reasons. Not just to get our costs under control, but to make a definitive statement to people who are living here now or people who might want to live here later that we're serious. We're absolutely serious about making change. And I don't see any other way. Now, we can get into the nitty-gritty of the, of the budget, I'll leave that to you guys. That's what you're here for, all right? The governor says he wants to cut spending, wants to cut this, cut that, no tax increase, all that. We're all 100% for it. But unless we create some kind of a mechanism that there'll be a long-term impact, 
I see the economy coming back in a couple of years and on the out years, well, guess what? We'll just increase aid here, we'll get increase spending here. It happens all the time. I don't know the last time anybody was concerned about rising costs of government in a booming economy because the revenues were there to sustain it. We need to develop some type of a long-term mechanism to get property taxes under control. I got six kids. I want them to be able to stay here. I want them to be able to be homeowners here. And I'm a small businessman as well. I know you are, Dean, and I'm probably some of the rest of you are. We want to make sure that we have a situation on Long Island in New York State that we can retain business, grow business, and maintain our tax base. 